it's welcome everyone. I think it's uh, afternoon for just about everybody on this webinar, so I can also say good afternoon and thank you for attending. We hope to reward your time with some, some very interesting and challenging discussion this afternoon. Uh, my name is Lachlan Cahoon. I'm the Australian and New Zealand editor for CDO Trends, and I'll be the moderator today for our webinar. The subject of which is Capitalising on Age's Digital Imperative, IT Strategies for Maximising Sustainable Growth Potential. So our thanks go to our partners Equinix and also to Dell and KPMG, which both have subject matter experts on our panel. <clears throat> Pardon me. So to set the scene, the synopsis of our discussion. Amidst the global economic uncertainty, Asia's digital ambitions remain resolute. Forward-thinking enterprises across Asia are adopting a digital-first approach and investing in AI, IoT analytics, and leveraging 5G to achieve competitive dominance and market share expansion. However, unlocking this potential demands seamless connectivity, expert navigation of complex technology landscapes, and robust data security. And there's some of the issues and challenges we'll be talking about this afternoon. So regarding our running order, we'll be hearing from our panelists in just a moment, and then we'll have some time at the end of the event for questions from you, the audience. So do feel free to go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and post your questions there, and hopefully we'll be able to get to them in time at the end of the discussion. But now to introduce our panellists, and thank, thank you very much to our panellists. Today we're joined by Jeremy Deutsch. Jeremy is the President of Asia Pacific at Equinix, by Garmin Chen, uh, who's the Tech Strategy Capability Lead at Digital Transformation at KPMG, and Tian Meng Ng, who's the Senior Vice President and General Manager, APJ Channels at Dell Technologies. Um, now, Jeremy Deutsch, if I might start with you, um, I know that in response to the um, growing demand for digital services from organizations in the Asia Pacific, Equinix has taken some steps to make some significant investments and, uh, and expand its, uh, its facilities in the region. So perhaps you can kick off with a bit of context setting and tell us about that. Yeah, sure, Lachlan. Th thanks for having me on the call today. Um, and you're absolutely right. We're seeing a huge amount of interest in growth and expansion in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, and Equinex, being a, a digital infrastructure company, are really focused on listening to our customers and, and taking some preparatory steps uh, to be available in some of these new markets. And I thought just as we kick off this discussion, it might be good to share actually a, uh, a slide. So if we can bring that slide up now, uh, just give everybody a bit of a view on some of the... Uh, the new markets that Equinix are making available specifically because our customers are looking to expand into the region. And, and when they're looking at that expansion, they're really seeing the digital opportunity abounding uh, across a bunch of new markets uh, in the Asia Pacific area. Uh, so you'll see on the map some of those green dots uh, where Equinix has been located, located for some time. Um, we have very strong infrastructure in, in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, China, uh, Japan, Korea, and Australia. Um, but recently, in actual fact, this year, we've uh, we've opened a bunch of new facilities already. Uh, so we've opened uh, some more expansion in Mumbai. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in India for uh, companies expanding into that particular area. So we have a number of sites coming live in Mumbai this year. Uh, so Mumbai 4 and Mumbai 3. Uh, we also have Chennai coming online later this year, um, really offering a pan-India strategy there, multiple locations in that market. Um, we've just brought online uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, uh, and we're very shortly about to turn on our facility in Johor Bahru, um, which is very proximate to Singapore. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, we also have another new market in Indonesia uh, with Jakarta coming online later this year as well. Uh, so you'll see us putting down uh, some more infrastructure, some of these uh, new markets, and then also continuing our expansion and scale uh, in some of our existing markets with new facilities in Tokyo uh, and a new facility in Seoul, SL4, um, already open this year. So just really exciting to see the amount of interest uh, in putting digital infrastructure into Asia Pacific. And I know we're going to have a, a lot of discussion with that. So I just wanted to give everybody a, a level set on the amount of investment we're putting in, and it's directly related uh, to the growth that people are looking to uh, deliver into the into the region across APAC. Back Excellent. to you, Lachlan. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, TB, from, uh, from Dell Technologies, can I start with you? How do you assess the key imperatives for organizations in 2024? What are the new trends that you're seeing? Yeah, thanks, Rockin. And, um, you know, I think the two big trends that we're seeing is really uh, obviously around Gen AI would be one and around multi-cloud. But let me just quickly talk about Gen AI. Um, you know, I think uh, obviously we've seen it. Uh, I think all of us have heard it. In fact, you know, as I travel around the region and meet with many 
you know, of our partners and customers. In fact, you know, obviously that's sort of top of conversation, but, you know, I think it's really exciting, you know, the market size in 2022, right, was just about 40 billion. And obviously based on all the analyst report, it's going to grow to 1.3 trillion in the next 10 years, right? So, you know, it's really accelerating at a hyper, hyper rate. Um, I think what's really exciting this year is that we've seen a lot of our, you know, customers and partners actually move really from what we call proof of concept to a proof of productivity, right? And that means a lot of them are actually now, you know, putting a lot of the Gen AI projects actually into production. You know, we have seen huge demand. I think you've probably seen in our recent, you know, earnings result, we've reported, I think in our fiscal quarter four, that we ship about, um, you know, 800 million of, uh, you know, servers. In fact, our you know, orders of our AI service improved sequentially, I think was 40 over percent. So, you know, definitely huge, huge, uh, you know, demand there. And I think why, you know, it is, is that obviously AI, Gen AI specifically, right, provides the ability to really generate content quickly, you know, design very innovative products, improve decision making and importantly, improve productivity, right, which I know many of companies, you know, in the region are really, you know, looking, uh, you know, for that. Um, and the next trend, you um, it's really around multi-cloud, right? And I know there's an area that I will speak about shortly too, that we do a lot with, uh, you know, Equinix on, but we really see, again, many companies, uh, I think a couple of years back was a debate around, should I keep all my workloads in the public cloud or should I keep it on-prem? I think now, frankly, I think everyone would agree, right? That it is going to be a multi-cloud world. In fact, I think a report by, a uh, survey by Gartner recently showed that 72% of companies are really deploying uh, sort of a multi-cloud strategy um, so, you know, in that, you know, strategy, we believe that companies will move their workloads, right? Both, uh, you know, on-prem, public cloud, obviously with data centers uh, provided such as, uh, you know, Equinix, right? So I think that is a space too that will really, really accelerate, uh, you know, this and the coming years. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, Garmin Chan from KPMG, if I could come to you for some comments on that. Are you seeing AI as, uh, as, the, as, the, big, uh, as the big issue as, uh, as TB has, uh, has talked about? Yeah, um, thanks a lot. And I totally agree with what TB just mentioned. Just add on uh, in terms of the um, key imperatives of 2024. Um, and AI is definitely a key topic that we are, we are looking at and many clients, many companies in the markets are talking about it. Um, but there were also other other sign of the AI that if many different parties or partners are, are thinking about it is around the ESG. Um, basically, the ethical use of AI when we were using um, a Gen AI, like TB mentioned, the proof of productivity, how to ethically use it uh, in a proper way and also uh, in an environmental friendly way. Because it, it, it talk about AI, there was a large amount, a huge amount of computing power will be required. And that's what exactly echo to our topic today about digital infrastructure, how to move the Gen AI, how to make it uh, move faster and then use it more intelligently. And also um, in, res in response to some cyber attack, um, when we are talking about AI and use of digital infrastructure in terms of security protection, um, protection uh, how to make good use of our data and at the same time protect our data. And no matter it's our customer data or production data, our own company's data, these are the topics that we are seeing a lot of companies and lots of clients are discussing nowadays. Um, it comes along with the new development of AI um, when we talk about yesterday, the ethical use of cybersecurity and also echo another point that TB mentioned about the multi-cloud strategy. Um, company are moving to cloud and at the same time, they're looking, looking um, at the cost of cloud. So how to better manage the cloud cost and how to, and that, that's exactly the area that we need a good partner to to work with that maybe Equidex and, and how to manage it in a proper way to control your cost, control your spending with a proper governance in place. So that's those are pretty much the area or the heat, very, very hot topics um, we are hearing in the market and the, and the company, especially in the economic environment now we are facing. Um, many, many um, C-suite um, and also the CIO, CDOs, they are, they are looking at these areas when, when we're talking to them, yeah. You would, so we are largely talking about expansion, but of course we are existing in, uh, in what is for some a quite a challenging macroeconomic environment. So Garmin, um, how is that impacting on, uh, on customers and, and how they're approaching you know, their digital challenges? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so so on one hand, many many our many of our clients are still continuing exploring the innovative technology like AI, but they are more um in the way of thinking about the ROI and also the the cost management side of it because the macro environment meaning we need um it, it give a, us a, a a further a stronger argument that we need to adopt innovative technology because it's no longer practical to use our old way of working with a lot of manual work uh, with a lo lot of um, uh, tedious work. Uh, it's a way of how to use innovative technology to move our work from automation to uh, to being smart to all the way to being cognitive. So this is the, the power of technology, how to change the way how they, they think in terms of a challenging world. But at the same time, um, they will also think about how to when we're adopting the technology, how to manage, uh, enforce a better, proper governance in managing the spending, uh, the spending in IT, the spending in our infrastructure uh, in a smart way. Not saying they are not spending money, but spending in the way that, in a smart way, that use in the edge of the technology in a way that worth it. And that's the way uh, how we are seeing the, 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 the leadership in the, from the different clients from the, our different companies they're thinking about in the digital world in, in responding to the challenging macro economy. Yeah. That's interesting. Jeremy, do you agree with that? Do you, is that what you're seeing as well? The companies, obviously cost has always been an imperative, but but they're seeing this as, as, a, as a productivity opportunity. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think um, we're seeing companies really take their existing spend and see what they can do to repurpose and, and reutilize to make sure they're making the most advantage of their budgets um, and really to see where they can get efficiencies. Of course, as economic cycles tighten, you do look to automation and you know use of information systems to really see if you can optimize your business. Um, so I think you know we're going to continue to see the double down on leveraging digital infrastructure to enhance profit margins, create new markets for different companies uh, and different new sectors. And so what sort of conversations are you having with, uh, with with customers that are AI specific in terms of what they need from you? Well, I, I think when it comes to AI, and, uh, and TB certainly mentioned this right at the top, that um, AI is very much a, a new paradigm. Um, many organizations we're seeing today are seeing it as an opportunity to reduce cost uh, in their baseline business as a starting point, uh, as a next step, seeing ways to innovate and create new business opportunities for their organizations. So it's that combination of the two. Um, and when it comes back to what are they looking to, you know, service providers like all of us for, I, I think they're looking to see how we can make it easy for them to utilize these new services. Uh, so obviously hybrid multi-cloud comes into play because some of the, the public cloud providers and service providers uh, provide some quick capability to get up and running. Um, but then you also need uh, the ability to have some of this architecture dedicated for yourself to make sure you follow all the governance rules and you're not providing you know, potential uh, upside to competitors utilizing same cloud services uh, to to utilize the information that you may have provided those cloud services. So I think that there's a combination there um, of speed to market, then also private architecture um, that companies are really looking to take advantage of when they're considering the use of AI technologies and machine learning in general. Yeah, thank you. Uh, TB, is that sort of a tally with the sort of conversations that you're having with, with, with your customers and enterprises that you deal with? Yeah, definitely so, right? Um... You know, as, as I mentioned earlier on, um, and what I guess Gemma and Jeremy was mentioning, right, is that we see now many companies, you know, taking the AI, um, you know, Gen AI sort of projects and really going into, uh, you know, production. And what I think is what Jeremy mentioned, we are working to make it easier for companies to really deploy, right, these Gen AI solutions. For example, we launched what we call a validated, um, you know, reference architecture for Gen AI. And that means, you know, we worked with NVIDIA, for example, on sort of putting our server, uh, you know, with the GPUs together with the NVIDIA Enterprise AI software instead. Um, you know, so, you know, it really enables companies to leverage off not only our infrastructure, but using the NVIDIA uh, Enterprise AI software that comes with sort of pre-trained, uh, you know, learning models to really get them up to speed rather than sort of building their learning model from scratch. You know, they have pre-trained models actually for different verticals, whether it's finance, whether it's manufacturing, healthcare, so it really, enables companies to really sort of, um, you know, get into their training, their models and getting into production a lot quicker. 
And where does uh, where does IoT sit in this? Is this is that sort of where the uh, does that sit before the AI? Is it where the data is is collected and goes into into the models to train? And how is that sort of um, factoring into this, uh, this this equation that we're talking about here? Yeah, um, I think it's definitely happening. I mean, we see frankly the merging between uh, you know IoT and uh, sort of traditional uh, you know IT, and mm. uh, that actually brings along sort of the other trend that we haven't mentioned yet, which is the edge. Uh, yep. You know, we do see a huge explosion in the whole area of edge computing. Um, so, you know, at Dell, we also, you know, just I think last year, just launched our what we call the Dell Native Edge, uh, you know, solution. What essentially it is, is that it's a software layer that allows companies now to manage the proliferation of different, all the different edge devices. And we do, do know in IoT, a lot of different IoT, uh, you know, um, certifications and different, uh, you know, platforms. So, this software layer that we've launched actually enables companies to now really manage whether it's a Dell H device or non-Dell H device, uh, you know, manage, uh, you know, all of them together in terms of security, in terms of deployment. Um, so that's a really exciting area too on the edge. And just interestingly enough, the team that actually designed this whole native edge platform actually is in Asia. In fact, it's based in Singapore, the global engineering team that designed it. Gavin, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I totally agree. In terms of IoT, because um, because we all know AI is not a new thing, right? It happens for many many years. So you become more and more popular, um, more and more practical. Is mainly, I guess, two two things. Right? One is the computing power is getting stronger and stronger. Um, our digital infrastructure can support to compute uh, or consume large amount of data. And the second point is we can get more and more data for the AI model to run and to train, to understand and to produce. So IoT is definitely an additional layer or additional channel that can collect much, much more data than before. It is basically empowered the AI, AI computing to make, make AI even more practical and more possible for, for our client in many different locations. Because um, so, so we all know AI is an old term, basically, or old technology, I would say in, in that way. But now with the IoT, with edge computing, with compute and a large amount of computing powers to, to empower our AI models to make it happen. It, it can apply to many different use cases, maybe say even for like ESG reporting or, or environmental control or even added for, for, for communication, a different device. And then there was also a term called AIoT, basically AI plus IoT to make everything happen um, more seamlessly and more more uh, much quicker way so so definitely um it's a new trend that that happening uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't say a new channel I would, it's more a a, a a new technology a new way of working to make this te old technology more practical and more real in in today's world yeah hmm, interesting i see you're not nodding away there jeremy would you agree with that yeah look i i think tb brings up a really good point around edge um, so when you're looking at IoT, collecting that data has become, you know, mission critical, as I inferred, you know, that data is, you know, corporate intelligence, really, if it is implied with an AI or a machine learning model. So really bonding those together, I think is important. But when you come back to edge, it's about the ability to deploy that infrastructure in multiple locations. It's no good just to centralize it anymore in one location. Uh, people are really pushing that to the edge to make sure those uh, services are available in the markets that are needed as close to the users as possible and making sure that's deployed uh, and making sure that that is done in a repeatable fashion is really important. So you don't want to have to custom uh, do those deployments every time. You want to be able to actually have them to the point where you can rinse and repeat and reuse. Yeah, you did in our pre-event discussion. You did make that point about repeatability, um, and so that's that's so that a uh, an up-and-coming um, company in Malaysia has access to the same technology that uh, that, that a, a multinational does and can and can um, roll out the same the same sort of digital capabilities not only in its own market but uh, but as it expands overseas. Is that is that how you see it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so TB mentioned it. I think Garmin also that multi-cloud is definitely the architecture that companies want to utilize. Um, now, when you're doing that, you don't want to have to use different clouds in different countries. You want to be able to have the same architecture uh, and the same business partners there to support your solution. So if you're deploying your architecture, no longer you're going to do that in one central location. You're going to do it in multiple edge locations. And you want to make sure those business partners are there. So your cloud partners, your network partners to bring in your IoT information, 
um, your service provider partners to do AI or um, machine learning requirements. And then you want to be able to gel that all together and connect it into your global architecture so that your security, your governance are done in a very thoughtful manner. And then hopefully, if you can do things really well, to Garmin's point, you want to make sure that you have your ESG wrapping over the top of that, that the infrastructure is truly sustainable, um, you know, which is a big part of the Equinix proposition where, you know, in 20, uh, 2020, uh, we suggested that we would go for a, a 2030 commitment to be carbon neutral. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that as a, as a company, we're very much tracking towards that. So we're now 96% of our uh, global data center footprint is uh, utilizing renewables. And we actually just announced a power purchase agreement in Australia uh, in the last uh, couple of months, which will see us now moving towards that full 100%. So that ESG requirement, making sure that the uh, digital infrastructure is done sustainably, really wraps it up for, for most global corporates as they're considering really deploying their infrastructure in a sustainable fashion. Thank you. Um, I was going to get to green IT, but you kind of beat, beat me to it, but we'll talk about that now. Um, do you see um, um, Garmin, for example, do, do you see that, um, green IT as a, as a compliance issue or as, as an opportunity for, for, for companies? Do you think that uh, that they're moving to this area because they have net, net zero targets and they're obliged to do it to to, uh, to placate their shareholders and their boards? What, what is the, the operational advantage that they can possibly get out of it? Um, I see both ways, right? Um, obviously, definitely, there's a compliant um, request or ask to to go green or go environmental friendly. Definitely, that that's something there across many different countries and and jurisdictions for sure. But at the same time, um, um, our comp our clients said that when they're looking to serve their end customer, their their end customer also asking for looking for a green operation from the from the clients from from this enterprise. It, the operation not only happened to the business side or business operation side, but also the underlying supporting IT or the underlying supporting infrastructure. They want to know that the, the service, the end customer want to know the service they receive from this company are produced by a green operation, there, for example. So that there's something is not only a expectation from the compliance uh, or regulators, but also expectation from their end customer and basically the whole environment that asking for a green operation and green technology to be used and to be adopted. And from the company itself, from their own, own perspective, it also means that they can use a more environmental uh, friendly way to sustain their IT operation. It may, in, in some 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 chance or some scenario we see, they will actually help them save some cost. Um, for example, the utility consumption, for example, because um, we know that there will be a huge utility consumption, a power consumption when it, in some of the IT infrastructure or some IT operation. And in some way, it also help them to save their cost. So um, ESG, I would say um, there's such sustainable growth, a sustainable operation, not only uh, a compliance or regulation pressure, but also an expectation that we are moving forward, the end customer um, expecting and also would be beneficial to the company's own IT operation. Thank you. At TB, I'd welcome your perspective on, on green IT. Yeah, sustainability is obviously, you know, a core part of our strategy. Uh, in fact, it's really in everything that we do, you know, from our raw materials uh, to our manufacturing process and even to the transportation, right? Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a big part of our company strategy. In fact, I think government's mentioning about, um, you know, sustainability in the products, right? So, just for example, in our PowerEdge server uh, product, we since 2013, we've actually reduced the uh, you know, energy you know, intensity by 83%. And that what it means is that what required sort of six servers in 2013 can actually now be accomplished just by one server. Um, so you know, it's a pretty significant there. The other sort of key area of our strategy is really through our Apex, uh, you know, which is our as a service offering. Um, you know, we believe that Apex, you know, by offering this as a service, we can really help reduce sort of over provision, uh, you know, uh, over provisioning, you know, really improve um, energy usage, reduce e-waste, uh, and obviously then help companies, right, you know, to minimize the carbon footprint. And, you know, working with Equinix, actually, we do provide, um, you know, Apex, you know, as a service with Equinix. So, definitely encourage companies to, you know, look into that. And then finally, we do, you know, as part of our sustainability strategy, uh, have a asset recovery um, uh, service offering, actually, where we can actually recover back 
you know, infrastructure, whether it's sort of PC servers or even storage. And in fact, working with our channel partners, we actually, you know, give them an incentive to actually motivate them to take back this equipment, whether it's Dell or non-Dell, actually. And that obviously uh, is a key part of our sustainability strategy. Thank you. Now, can I turn to the issue of connectivity? And, and obviously, um, that is absolutely vital. Um, and that's, I would imagine, that's why uh, why Equinix is, is locating um, its data centers in the, in the in these emerging markets to to provide latent latency at the edge for the, for for its uh, its um, customers there. Uh, Garmin, do you think that that organisations are finding the connectivity that they really need to to enable a lot of the things that we've been talking about here? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so so. Because with just now with many of the workload or many of their their um systems application within the cloud, like connectivity become one of the um key topic uh, when they when they're choosing their co-location data center or the cloud service provider. Um, this one is not only about um getting the speed up, um, getting the the resources closer to their to their customer, but also some of the um, locations when um, there was uh, some jurisdiction from a regulator perspective, they also have some expectation in terms of the latency, in terms of connectivity, in terms of where the data store. So that is how we are seeing like uh, many cloud service provider, many data center provider, and they are choosing to a multi-location um, strategy to get closer to the business, get closer to the customer, and that will help them to deliver the, basically help their clients um, to get the results, get the get the service quicker and easier, yeah. And do you think that they're finding that though? Do you think that they're, they're is, is this a, a roadblock or um, are they finding the uh, the connectivity that they need? Uh, they're, they're, they're getting there. I, I think they're, they're getting there. In the, in the old days, uh, there was some some concern or some questions around around that. But but now now the, now the landscape is rapidly changing. Like, like, like the landscape, we have more and more such of the service available in multiple locations, like Equinix, I, I am sure Jeremy can share more in terms of the strategy. Um, and but um, the, the the enterprise, the client we're talking, we are seeing they are getting there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy, does it make it sort of more important to, for for collaboration between um, all players in the ecosystem, such as Equinix and, and and telcos? Is it much more of a sort of agnostic plug and play environment that, that we that we're living in now is rather than a, a one size fits all where, where, where organizations are, are taking best of breed and, and using your platform to to configure their infrastructure in the best way they need yeah so when we what we really see with our customers who are taking advantage of the equinix platform is they're not connecting to tb's point to one cloud anymore they're connecting to multiple clouds. They're not connecting to one network service provider. They're connecting to multiple network service providers, even to the point where they're actually connecting directly with their supply chain and business partners as well in our facilities, um, and then leveraging connectivity between themselves across multiple geographies. So connectivity has become the lifeblood. If it wasn't before, it certainly is now the lifeblood of digital commerce. Um, now, making sure you can extend that to the edge has also become critically important. You have markets that Equinix are entering um, at the moment, like Indonesia, which has over 270 million people, very high uh, rate of digitization there, great business opportunity for both domestic organizations in Indonesia, as well as global uh, multinationals entering. And they want to be able to offer that service directly in that market. There may be sovereignty reasons. Certainly to Garmin's point, there's a lot of usability uh, features that become far more beneficial if they're located with a low latency directly in market. Um, so when you combine all of those things together, having the set of connectivity options with multiple different partners needed, having the right locations, um, having that ability to do so in a repeatable fashion in a consistent format makes it really easy for CIOs. It becomes a toolkit for them uh, to consider their expansion, whether they're using you know, services like Apex to then roll that out um, with Dell across the, the global footprint. Um, you know, That can be another way to really get this to a point where it's repeatable, um, customers can can leverage that. CIOs can make sure they can deploy their infrastructure in an easy fashion, which is ultimately what it's about. Because of course, as I'm sure everybody in this call knows, we're all asked, all being asked to do less, as to sorry, to do more with less. That is always a challenge for us. So making sure it's repeatable um, really helps uh, reduce the costs as you're rolling out the infrastructure. So, Gavin, this environment that we're talking about has it changed in any way the um, the relationship between um, between enterprises and and their service providers and and, and the value that they're they're looking to get from them? Yeah, that's exactly the, what the point Jeremy just mentioned in terms of 
I'm doing more with less. Um, from from our the, the different enterprise and different service provider, they're looking for um, more more efficient way of um, receiving the service, um, more efficient way in delivering the service they will give to their end customer. So so the, so um, especially in, at the beginning we mentioned about the macro environment, uh, the the macroeconomic situation. They're looking for um, deliver the, the, the service in a more efficient and more uh, faster way. Um, so that's the expect. There's also an expectation to different service provider, including ourselves, like uh, including ourselves as a service provider to different enterprise, that the, the client are asking for more value added service. Um, from a did over or digital planning perspective, in a traditional way, uh, we may looking at a few technology. Now it's more looking at the overall holistic pictures, not only the adoption of how to use AI, for, for example, in terms of this technology standalone, but also mm -hmm. all the underneath infrastructure perspective, governance perspective, target operating model perspective, ESG perspective, all the way the full picture to see how to sustainable um, to grow and deliver this technology in a more efficient way. Thank you. Now, TB, you made the comment um, early on about about multi cloud um, and how that is um, that that's the way of the future. And it's obviously you know a lot of the applications and um, and services that we're talking about um, need that multi cloud environment. What would you say are some of the challenges that organisations face when the when, when they that they look to implement and move to this this infrastructure now? Yeah, honestly, I think the. Um companies would probably have a choice, right, of trying to, whether trying to do it, uh, you, you know, themselves or, you know, working with a different, uh, you know, provider, right, you know, or a partner. And I, I think hence, um, just again, I'd like to call out, right, our sort of very strategic partnership with Econix, um, you know, I, I think it's a really good partnership that we can offer uh, companies the, um, the ability to really deploy a multi-cloud you know, strategy really quickly and efficient, uh, you know, efficiently. In fact, we have a number of, uh, you know, offerings that we have uh, worked together with Econex on, for example, Apex I mentioned earlier, but we also have what we call bare metals service network optimization. And just the last one I want to quickly mention that's important, it's called custom infrastructure solutions, right? And what this is, is that it's really offering our Dell sort of technology hardware uh, located within uh, Equinix, frankly, right next to the Equinix fabric. And, um, you know, we see a lot of, uh, you know, interest from companies wanting to use that because it, you know, really allows them to deploy their sort of multi-cloud or hybrid cloud sort of offering in sort of the very fast, efficient and secure manner. Hey, can I jump in there, Lachlan? Um, just, just a point there that TB mentioned, um, just to give everybody a data point, we're seeing consistently that companies that take a network optimization approach, utilizing some of the services from Equinix or Dell or others, um, are seeing perhaps up to a 30% reduction in their network costs and often are seeing a five times increase in the amount of bandwidth that they have available. So getting a reduction in costs and a huge increase in throughput is really adding a lot of uh, benefit to the architecture, which of course frees up funds that can be invested in other things like AI, et cetera. Um, so those are just some examples of where we're seeing companies really take that ability. And one of the, the services that we're getting a lot of interest on in some of our digital services, which enable our customers to deploy that uh, type of deployment without actually having to put infrastructure in straight away, uh, very similar to some of the capabilities that the Dell offers as well. Um, and either one of those can give you the advantages of being able to turn this on and get some of those benefits very quickly, drive the cost down in your business and enable that, enable that reinvestment of the, those saved funds into new services and new capabilities. And, and I think that's what a lot of CIOs are looking to do at the moment. As I said, budgets may be flat, but that does not necessarily mean that the innovation has to stop. Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a case of being able to do uh, to do to streamline the operation um, and um, and get and get uh, and get more out of um, possibly less uh, resources. Is that would that be it? Yeah, correct, correct. I, I think there's a great opportunity in the market to do that. And when you consider the multi-cloud capabilities, the repeatability, the architecture that you know the service providers on this call provide, the toolkit is there. So the opportunity is there perhaps for the first time, especially as you're considering all these new locations um, to really enable it. And I think that efficiency will give a lot of, um, I guess, uh, capacity for budgets um, for organizations to do a bunch of innovative things in their digital infrastructure. Um, so I think that's what everybody's looking for at the moment. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, toolkit. It's a great word. What's in this toolkit? Is it? Is it's connectivity. It's edge. Um, it's. Uh, I would say what, multi-cloud. To TB's point as well, multi-cloud mm -hmm. definitely in there. Hybrid multi-cloud. I would say again with a combination of just simply taking the services from Dell and Equinix. It's also a toolkit that is. You can bring your own or you can leverage some of the infrastructure that we can provide even up the stack. Um, so with Apex or with Equinix's metal service, um, these services provide you different options for how you want to deploy as well. So that toolkit is ever expanding. And again, inside the Equinix ecosystem, you've got a plethora of options where you can really bring the best of breed together to create a solution um, that really suits your purposes. Do you have any comments about that, Garmin? The toolkit. What, what what do you see um, as as the the, the appropriate uh, uh, tools in the in, in the bag? Well, I I would say the uh, what the name of the toolkit as asset. So um, it's the asset from multiple or different um service provider. Well, even side like, like professional service from like like us like KPMG. Um, we work closely with different alliance partners like like Equinix, like Dell, that, that to bring along the asset they they can they already created accumulate from different experience, accumulate from the expertise they have in mind that to bring to the client. So this toolkit will accelerate the, the adoption of digital, ad adoption of the, the digital infrastructure, adoption of new technology. So we, we, we basically name it as asset. It's an asset that could help our client to speed up their process of digital adoption. Uh, we'll start moving to some uh, some questions from from the audience, and uh, and I would encourage people who are who are um, on the call to if they've got some comments uh, and some questions uh, of our expert panel, please do put them in the uh, in the Q and A box at, at the bottom of the screen. We'd be very welcome to uh, to, to pose those those questions. Now, uh, now TB, the, the toolkit. What what it would seem to me that um, from from our discussions, a lot of these technologies are, are now reaching um, a, a, a place of, uh, of maturity uh, where you can put them all together. Um, you know. We've been sort of a lot of organisations have been stumbling along over the last couple of years trying to come up with 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 a optimum in infrastructure that, that suits them as, as they expand and, and as they roll out digital services. Would you say that that the toolkit is is, is at a is, is at an exciting point of maturity now in twenty twenty four? Yeah, hundred percent. Right. I, I think um, you know, I think we're all on the same team, right? Of companies. I think we mentioned it at the start of wanting to do more with less, and obviously, you know. Having this toolkit would really allow companies to really execute, right? And, um, you know, deploy, you know, in the most efficient manner. And obviously, right, I don't think we spend, you know, um, time talking about security, uh, you know, per se, but security is obviously a big you know, aspect of that. And with the toolkit, um, you know, it would really sort of address that area too, which should be a big, big concern, right? Because obviously besides cost, security is a big thing. Um, so yes, I would think, uh, you know, a toolkit uh, with a service provider such as Equinix, right, would really enable companies to really sort of move and execute, you know, a lot quicker. We have some questions coming through. Um, are companies you talk to concerned about the regulatory environment for Gen AI, especially those in the finance sector? Uh, Garmin, can I ask that of you? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, um, definitely, I have talked to many um, financial sector clients that they, they want to explore the adoption of Gen AI, but also a concern of some compliance or, or regulatory requirements, for example, um, I'm based in Hong Kong, that, that there was some some concern over that. So um, when in terms of the adoption or, or the um, exploration of Gen AI, we see many financial sector clients, they explore from back office operation. Um, so meaning the, uh, the adoption of Gen AI or the use of data not yet touch the customer data now but they were using the beauty of Gen AI to speed up their back office operation, for example, take out the, the regulation articles, um, to, for example, to help them speed up the IT service process, for example. So that's how they try to explore the beauty of Gen AI to explore, to understand how Gen AI could support their, uh, their operation before they can explain to regulator, they can come for the op to do the, to the regulator how Gen AI can really support their business in a secure, compliant, and a safe manner. So that's how we're seeing the trend this year or even in the past half year, the adoption or exploration of financial setup in exploring this um, new technology. And Jeremy, is an advantage for you in navigating some of these things to be located in um, in, in, in different um, geographies as, as you are and expanding into them? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that 
the, the regulatory environment uh, and the general uh, environment for AI is slightly different across different mm -hmm. countries across APAC. Um, and certainly having uh, infrastructure available in Malaysia, which is a very attractive market at the moment, and Japan and Australia uh, for some of these Gen AI applications is, is quite important. I would say the other thing that we've seen progress um, with Gen AI uh, and in general the use of you know NVIDIA style uh, chipsets uh, is the amount of density uh, that people are looking to deploy in their, their physical data centers. Um, so being able to provide liquid cooling has become quite an important concept as well, something that Equinex has already rolled out into numerous of our facilities around the Asia Pac region. Um, so really that combination of uh, governance, the combination of um, you know chip availability and that ability to then support these types of deployments has become very uh, important to our customers and across multiple sectors, I would suggest. Excellent. Thank you. We do have a good question here, actually, from Vijay Marath. Um, I'll read his question um, and I'll put it to the, to the panel. Um, I come from the Global Capability Centre at Schneider Digital. While most of the strategies are applicable to us, such as network optimization, green IT, edge location, et cetera, I'd like to understand any specific, specific tailored IT strategies for GCCs. Um, I'll put that out there. Does anybody want to, want to go first on that one? Quite interesting. I just came from Schneider Electric, actually, uh, you know, before this, <laughs> uh, getting on this uh, call. Uh, I was there uh, meeting up with Venkat, who leads the East uh, sort of Asia region. And uh, yeah, I think we're definitely working closely with Schneider, uh, between Dell and Schneider. Uh, Schneider Electric, uh, you know, obviously the really strategic partner of ours in the whole um, uh, data center space where we do have a lot of joint solutions. But interestingly enough, uh, we are making a lot of what we call integrated solutions together uh, with Schneider Electric. Um, and again, back to the whole team, right? Of making it easier. I think we were saying toolkit, right? That's what we we're discussing earlier. So very similar concept. We're working between Dell and Schneider Electric to really come up with sort of integrated solutions similar to the toolkit concept, right? Um, you know, of having sort of Dell, uh, you know, infrastructure together with Schneider Electric sort of, uh, you know, together in a in, in, in sort of a integrated, uh, you know, an engineered fashion, right? Um, so yeah, we're, we're definitely sort of working closely with Schneider Electric on that, yeah. Jeremy, can I ask you, uh, specifically yeah, sure. IT for GCCs? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, when you're looking at the business of a, an organization like Schneider, it is very distributed. You have customers across the entire region, obviously across the entire world. So being able to have, uh, you know, you mentioned network uh, optimization, edge solutions, these kinds of things are very important. But being able to make sure that you have that architecture ready to deploy as you're entering new markets, there to deploy uh, to support infrastructure that you're putting into those markets, you know, products and services that you're selling into those markets and the teams that you have in those markets, I think that is becoming critically important. And that is something we've done for many similar organizations to Schneider um, as well across the APAC region. So I would say plenty of use cases we can provide uh, to show what best practice looks like. I mean, in general, um, uh, on, on GCCs, I mean, is there a particular sort of uh, infrastructure approach, any particular issues that you're seeing? You must see quite a few of them um, um, in, in your travels. Oh, I would say the, the um, GCC or the Capability Center, it's a, um, for many organizations, uh, not only China, um, it's, um, it, it's, it's a center that power how the, 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 um, the company operate in many different locations. So it may provide their expertise knowledge. They may provide their central service there. So that it's about how to um, make your own service more assetized. So it's not only getting the toolkits from our service provider, but also getting your, your own set of IT toolkits to empower your own IT operation. So that, that will imply some, if you're talking about IT strategy, that will imply a huge um, consideration or comprehensive consideration of the your operating model, your IT operating model, how you work closely with different location in a cost effective manner. Um, so so they would they would they would talk about how you communicate with them, how you manage your cost to them, how you manage your chargeback, for example, to different location, mm -hmm. how you share your asset to them. So there's a whole um, IT operation play. It's not only about adopting the technology to empower your, your GCC operation, but they're also underlying the governance and operation um, discussion that we are having with many uh, GCC from different clients, yeah. 
Excellent. Thank you. Now, we have a long question from Nishal. Um, now, there are several aspects of this question, so I'll, I'll just pick them out. This is one I quite like, because we have been talking about uh, hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. But the question is, additionally, in the era of multi-cloud adoption and AI integration, how can fully managed private cloud services, particularly for AI supercomputing, contribute to driving innovation and growth? Maybe I can jump in on this one. I, I would say... One of the things that we're seeing is um, many organizations are starting to perhaps dabble with AI or perhaps maybe have been doing that over the last four or five months. And in that dabbling, they've been doing it in a, in a fast beat to market way and they've been using the public clouds to do so. And that seems to make a lot of sense, right? Rather than build your own model and uh, just design your own architecture and deploy it, you can actually get up and running very quickly in public clouds. For that, you need secure access to the public clouds. You've got a huge amount of data going backwards and forwards. So doing that with an interconnection mindset is critically important. So that's sort of step number one to get yourself started. Once you go past the point of starting and you prove that there is some use for your data through AI models to come back with insights for your organization, which largely every organization we're talking to is seeing the benefits, then you look to how do you create that at an enterprise uh, scale and how do you do so in a secure and private fashion? And that's really where the uh, next wave of models we see coming in, which are going to be private infrastructure, private AI um, being deployed right next to the public clouds, right next to your core infrastructure, uh, deployed to the edge ultimately. That's where we're starting to see a lot of momentum right now. Now, obviously, there's a number of providers there. I know TB mentioned Dell plays in this space as well. Obviously, NVIDIA is a name on many people's lips. Um, Equinix also has a partnership with them. I know Dell uh, also works with them. So there's a lot of opportunity there to uh, build these kind of solutions and have dedicated private AI. And we really look at, you know, regulated organizations or regulated industries, larger organizations are really going to take this as the model um, moving into the second half of, of 2024 and into 2025. That is going to be the architecture that's going to win. Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on that or shall I move to the next question? No, I definitely agree. I think with what Jeremy mentioned, in fact, that's exactly what we're seeing is that, you know, a lot of companies were actually sort of doing just piloting and trials and some of them were doing on the public cloud, some of them were sort of doing with local sort of CSPs, right? Or cloud service providers too. But I think this year we've seen many go into production and I think that's what Jeremy sort of articulated, right? I think the value proposition of, of putting it in a data center provider like Equinix really makes sense where you can, as I mentioned, you know, put your, put a Dell infrastructure, for example, right next to the Equinix, uh, you know, fabric. And that would allow you sort of the best of both worlds, right? Of getting that good connectivity, security, and still have it sort of private and benefit it uh, on the public cloud if you need it, right? Yeah. Now, Garmin, I see you're nodding your head yeah. there. Would you like to this one? Yeah, just to add a small point uh, on top of that, that is um, when, when we're going private, there were definitely, um, I, I, I saw the question also mentioned about the security and also another yeah. element about the cost implication. So that's where exactly where you show um, all different enterprise shall get the toolkit or the asset ready with the right partner. Right? I say, for example, Equinus and Dow, you have the readily available toolkits and assets to help you speed up the process when managing your cost and managing the security concern. So when you go private, they will always come with this question and you know, that you need to build your own set of stuff. And that's exactly where you should plan it in a more strategic way, in a holistic way. So not only to continue you leveraging the beauty of the AI supercomputing, but also controlling the cost implication when you go private and also controlling the cybersecurity elements when you go private. Thank you. Yeah, and Nish, I did have a, have a question on um, on cyber, which uh, I'll put out there. Moreover, amidst evolving cyber threats, what strategies are crucial for enterprises to future-proof their infrastructure, ensuring long-term trust with customers? I would add to Garmin's point, just, just in general security, and I know TB probably will have something to add here as well, um, one of the key things we're seeing is people moving their infrastructure off the public internet onto private uh, interconnect. That is a key thing that changes the security profile that you're looking at. Um, so that really means locating yourself right next to your business partners. So if that is utilizing Equinix's fabric to connect to multi-cloud 
or Equinix, you know, utilizing even simple cross connects inside the Equinix facility to connect to business partners, that can completely change the security profile you have to consider when connecting to your business partners. Uh, so that can be a major thing, uh, even just at a fundamental level there. But I, I'd imagine TB has more to add. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. And, um, you know, definitely agree. I think that would be a really critical element, I think, of a cybersecurity strategy. Um, Look, at, at, at that, we take a step back. I think, um, you know, we, we um, you know, obviously, um, you know, believe it's a huge topic. Uh, in fact, what our whole cyber strategy, um, you know, is uh, sort of the way we sort of position it is what we call zero trust approach. We believe that, you know, that would be sort of, uh, you know, the strategy that companies should, uh, you know, should, should move towards. We do recognize that uh, zero trust is going to be tough to actually, um, you know, deploy. You know, in fact, quite an interesting uh, um, project that we launched just last year, we call it Project Fort Zero, where, you know, we have a sort of a validated design that is actually validated by the Department of Defense in the US, right, where we brought in sort of 30 uh, leading uh, technology vendors around the world where, you know, we actually integrate it and uh, really get it validated by the Department of Defense that it is really a secure and a really a, a zero trust, uh, you know, kind of solution, right? Uh, and again, it's all around the whole topic of like getting a toolkit, right? So that's example of something that we're doing around the security space that we're bringing, uh, you know, to the market. But just to go back to what Jeremy mentioned um, of putting it in a, you know, data center that's that's secure in a very, uh, um, you know, optimized manner. So definitely, you know, fully agree with that, yeah. Now we've got to just under five minutes left. So there are one or two questions here. Um, there's one question here that I think um, is a good way for us to uh, to take out the, the discussion because it's, uh, it enables us uh, also to um, to give um, give a bit, a bit of a wrap on, um, on on what we've been talking about today. Uh, so it's from Alex So, and Alex has asked, given the current macro environment with clients keep finding ways to cut costs and minimize waste, what are some of the leading reasons or rationales which have successfully convinced the clients in adopting innovations and emerging technologies? It's kind of a, a bookend of a question to, to our whole discussion in, in some way. So, so perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll go around the panel and you can each answer that one in the context of possibly some final remarks. So Garmin, could I ask you first? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, when we're talking about, with, in a, actually a, a, a very real question that um, many clients ask me every day. Um, it, it's not about when you're talking about a, the adoption of technology. It's not about the technology, I would say. It's about the use case, the scenario of the business drive that why you want to do so. So when we talk about Gen AI, it's not like, like it, no no one will use Gen AI for the sake of just trying Gen AI. It's mm -hmm. about the, the use case you're trying to 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 adopt. So, for, so even nowadays, when we're saying saying digital we we'll always say in the good days when you're in a good economy digital is how help is the way to help you empower your grow faster in the back days like now in the um, macro environment a little bit challenging digital is a way to help you turn around the, the challenging situation so um it's not about uh, adopting the, the technology or emerging technology itself it is about the actual use case how your business is operating today for example, if you're talking about the back office operation, are there still many, many work around? Are there still many data error, data in inconsistency there? Can the technology really help you to improve that in a in a more similar, similar and, and efficient way? And that's how with the way we convince the client or the, the client find the actual use case to adopt the technology. Otherwise, when we're talking about Genuine, many clients will think, where should I start? It actually start looking back in your business. It's a, not an IT or technology question. It's a business question. That do you want to turn around your business in the challenging time? And where is the most painful area that you want digital to help you? Yeah. Excellent. That was great. TB, can I ask you? Yeah, I think similar to what Garmin mentioned, I think um, you know you shouldn't be looking at Gen AI just for the sake of it, right? It's really about the business outcome. And uh, again, talking to many companies, right, you know, across the region, I think we had the benefit of chat GPT, right? It sort of makes it easier, I think, for the layman to understand uh, sort of Gen AI, right? But, you know, we have so many very compelling use cases, right, that, you know, really translate into actual productivity, you know, improvements, uh, you know, and hence, um, you know, I think, um, I, I think it's frankly easier, right, for a lot of board members and CEOs to really understand now, 
you know, why Gen AI is so critical, right? But, you know, you still need to do, obviously, uh, you know, your calculations, right? And looking at, you know, how many percent of productivity, what's your cost, uh, you know, savings that you will have, uh, you know, as a result of uh, whether it's Gen AI or whether it's some of these other trends we spoke about, multi-cloud or the edge, um, you know, it's all about, you know, embracing it because it's really a necessity. I really don't think it's an option right now, right? So I think, you know, the message really to the, you know, board members and CEOs uh, is really, uh, sort of looking at it to ensure that you use it for your own competitive advantage and to really sort of move forward, right, you know, in the market. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Jeremy, some, some final thoughts from you, please. Yeah, sure. I, I think just summing it up from my point, digital is a way to enable the business. If you're using it for that benefit, you're either saving the company costs or giving the company new revenue opportunities. And if you can do both, it's the perfect outcome. So leveraging all the technologies and use cases we've mentioned, Really, that's what it's about, helping the business achieve its outcomes. Excellent. Well, um, we have run out of time. It's um, it, it's the end of end of our time together here. So um, it's uh, now for me to, to thank the audience for participating and thank you for those questions from the floor and also to thank our, thank our panellists, Jeremy Deutsch from Equinix, TB from uh, Dog Technologies and Garmin Chen from KPMG China. I think we've had a very, uh, very wide-ranging and interesting discussion. I'm certainly very... Um, Excited and optimistic at um, the tipping point that uh, that te technology has reached in 2024. That organisations have got this toolkit that we've described to to really um, uh, to really make some fundamental changes based on um, on digital tools to to not only um, you know make themselves more efficient but also deliver better customer experiences and, and better outcomes for their shareholders. So uh, thank you, panelists. It's been a great discussion. Um, and um, here's the the QR code. We would very much like uh, like your feedback. Um, so if you could scan that QR code, it will take you to a, a, a short uh, feedback survey, and we would be very interested in, uh, in getting your feedback so that in the future we can provide some even better events for you. So, so thank you for attending. Thank you to Equinix for, uh, for, for collaborating with CDO Trends on this, on this event. Thank you to Dell Technologies, and thank you to KPMG, and uh, thank you to the audience. It's been a very interesting discussion.